of witchcraft produced in the Leyland Priory Club on Wednesday the 9th of November 1994. It's called Comedy Review. It is my sad duty to tell you that we had a tragic loss in our midst. During rehearsals for this production, after a period of pain and suffering, and despite many attempts, many valiant attempts at resuscitation, comedy as we know it, died. Therefore, as this event is in the nature of a wake, I will introduce you to the chief mourners. You, Teresa, Craig, Angela, Jennifer, Eddie, Pam, Paul, Harry, Sue, Moira, Ori, Delia, Peter, Michael, and Ron. No, I'm a joking. It's time to Why don't you get things started? It's time to get things started on the most sensational, inspirational, celebrational, confirmational. This is what we call Comic Review! What on earth was all that about? Sydney, no Sydney, you cannot be a carrot. A carrot is 
Christmas had flowers. Think, dear, think. How about being a tulip? No holly leaf isn't a flower. All right, you be a holly leaf. Now listen carefully to the music. Elvie, stop bouncing. No, bouncing isn't bouncing. And don't argue, Elvie. You just watch the others and you'll see. Now, when Miss Bolton plays her music, I want us all to get up onto our tipmost toes, like the feathers, and dance around the room wherever the music takes us. And there will be all the lovely flowers growing in the grass. Everybody ready? Oh, just a minute, Miss Bolton. Sydney. Come here, Sydney. What have you got in your mouth? Sydney, I can't hear a word you say, so go out of the room and pick it out, whatever it is, and then come back and tell me what it was. And both feet, Sydney, don't talk. Now, we're not going to wait for a silly little boy who puts things in his mouth like a baby. We're going to see lovely flowers growing in the grass with the sun shining down on us, and that is tall and beautiful. their legs, do they? <laughs> what flower are you? That's our baby. Are you? That's nice. Hazel, what do we do with our heads? We hold them up. I should think so. Come in, Sydney. Come in. There's no need to knock the door down like that, is there? Now, what do you have in your mouth? It can't have been nothing, Sydney, because I distinctly saw something. Yes, I know it's nothing now, but what was it then? <laughs> a big button? Well, I'm very glad you sat it out, can't you? You didn't, Sydney. Did you be all right? <laughs> we'll get back to your place then. Where did you get the button from? Off road, me pink frock. I'm ashamed of you, a big boy at four like that, eating the buttons off little girls' frocks. What flower are you going to be? I've quite forgotten. You'd better be a hollyhock. No, Sydney, you cannot be a super jet. <laughs> and if you're going to be a cross patch, then you'll have to go and sit down over there until you're a nice boy again. Go on. And you better be thinking, what flower are you going to be? Go on. Go and sit down over there and then, George. Now, children, listen. Listen carefully to the music. And then dance like flowers. At last, Miss Bolton, we're ready. I am so sorry. One, two, off we go.
Question number one. Before we start, would you like to be blindfolded? No. Like it. You obviously haven't seen the audience. <laughs> right, question number one. Who won the FA Cup final in 1950? FA Cup final, 1950. Tranmere Rovers. No? No, not Tranmere Rovers. That was additional information thrown in for your benefit. Quite brief. Oh, thank you. Who won the FA Cup in 1950? A Arsenal! Oh, yeah. That seems to have a very chesty cold, yeah? Chester! Chester won the FA Cup in 1950. <laughs> Not quite right. Arsenal! Arsenal! Arsenal won the FA Cup in 1950. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you. Second question from the mic. Who... Who was the English Prime Minister in England in 1801? English Prime Minister in England in 1801. Yes. Don't fall down that big deep pit, William! <laughs> the English Prime Minister in England in 1801 was William Big. Oh, no. <laughs> William D? No! William Pitt? Yes! <laughs> Thank you. Memory question number three. Who formed the British Police Force? I'm off now, sir. Well? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Memory, it's easy. As easy as peeling an orange. <laughs> The British Police Force was formed by Sir Max Jaffer. <laughs> no, but the Sir part was correct. Sir Nelgwyn? No, not quite correct. Sir, not quite correct. I appeal to you, Robert. Sir Robert Peel formed Sir Max Jaffer. <laughs> well, I think it was the British Police Force. As well. Wow, well done. Never a wrong moment. <laughs> Look at this audience. I've got the trouble with it. <laughs> Look at them. They're absolutely flabbergasted. They can't believe this ever happened. Well, can I have my money now? <coughs> Arsenal. <laughs> yes, I think it's worked very hard on that engagement. I think we can give you the fee of five groats. Ten groats? No, <laughs> I'm sorry, it was five groats. Ten? Five, I remember it distinctly. What is it, Greg? I thought you remembered everything. No, I've got a shot in memory. <laughs> five groats? Well, if you say so. <laughs> Awful! <laughs> All things bright and beautiful. All things bright and beautiful. All creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. All things dull and ugly, all creatures short and squat, all things rude and nasty, the Lord God made the lot. <laughs> each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings, he made their glowing colours, he made their tiny wings. Each little snake that poisons, each little wasp that stings, he made their brutish venom, he made their horrid wings. The rich man at his castle, the poor man at his gate, God made them high or lowly, in order to their escape. All things sick and debilitating, all evil, great and small, all things foul and irritating, the Lord God made them all. A purple headed mountain, the river running by, the sunset in the morning, that brightens up the sky. Each nasty little hornet, each beastly little squid. Who made the spiky urchin? Who made the sharks? He did. He gave us eyes to see them, and lips that we might tell. How great is God Almighty, who has made all things well. All things scabbed and crusty. <laughs> all evil, great and small. Putrid, foul and rusty. The Lord God made them all. 
Family antique have you brought for me to value for you? This, that rumble Good Lord, you know old, isn't it? <laughs> Edwardian at least. Possibly even Victorian. <laughs> have you had it long? What experience do you have for this post? Well, I used to work around the church. I've got a well-rounded personality. And I work like the clappers. Well, thank you very much. I've got others to see, so I'll give you a bell. by drills for the preliminary cold face scouting operations now. Oh, that sounds nice, dear. Tungsten carbide drills? What the hell is tungsten carbide drills? It's something they use in coal mining, Father. It's something they use in coal mining, Father. <laughs> You're all ruddy fancy talk since you went up there. Up to Yorkshire. Is that idea, dear? <coughs> it's new play opens at National Theatre. Oh, that's good. <laughs> good? Good? What do you know about it? Well, 
what do you know about getting up at five o'clock in the morning to fly off to Paris? <laughs> Back at old Vic at twelve for drinks. <laughs> Sweating the day through press interviews and television interviews. And then back here at 10 o'clock at night to wrestle with the problems of a homosexual, nymphomaniac, drug addict involved in the ritual murder of a well-known Scottish footballer. That's a full working day, lad, and don't you forget it. <laughs> don't shout at the night, father! Uh, Amstead wasn't good enough for you, was it? Had to go poncing off to Barnsley with your coal mining, mate. <laughs> coal mining's a wonderful thing, Father, but it's something you'll never understand. Just look at you! Oh, Ken, you know, it's like after a few novels, be careful. Come on, lad, come on, how are we? What's wrong with me, you nit? I'll tell you what's wrong with you. Your head's addled with novels. You come home each night, reading of Chateau Le Tour. Oh, please. And look what you've done to Mother. She's worn out with meeting film stars, <laughs> attending premieres, and giving gala luncheons. No, oh, no. There's no wrong with gala luncheons, lad. I've had more gala luncheons than you've had off dinners. No. Ah, ah. Oh, 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 oh. What is it? Oh, no. What is it? It's his right to cramp, Kenneth. <laughs> you never said anything about this. Would you like to? I'm all right, woman, I'm all right. Just get him out of here. You'd better go, Kenneth. All right, I'm going. After all we've done for him. <laughs> but one day you'll realise there's more to life than culture. There's dirt and there's smoke. <laughs> And there's good on his sweat. <laughs> Go on, get out, get out. You, you labourer. <laughs> hey, you know, mother, I think there's a play there. Get dangerous and fall. Right. <laughs> now, please come in, Miss W. A. Large flies. 
<laughs> Correct. What did Marilyn Monroe always claim to wear in bed? The parachute. <laughs> Correct. What was the next new TV station to go on air after Channel 4? Channel number 5. Correct. <laughs> what do we normally associate with Bedlam? Breakfast television. Correct. What aren't jock straps? Not cases. <laughs> Correct. What would a jockey use a stirrup for? An athletic support. Correct. Arthur Scargill is well known for what? He puts his foot in it. <laughs> Correct. Who was the famous clown who made people laugh with his funny hair? Leader of the mine work of you. <laughs> Correct. What would a decorator use methylene chloride to make? Cocoa. Correct. <laughs> what did Henri Toulouse Lautrec do? Paint strippers. Correct. What is Dean Martin famous for? Is he an artist? Yes, what kind of an artist? Uh, pass. Yes, that's near enough. <laughs> what make of vehicle is the standard London bus? A singer. Correct. In 1892, Brandon Thomas wrote a famous long-running English farce. What is it? British Whale. <laughs> Correct. And with the following quotation about Virginia Bottomley. Her heart may be in the right place, but her... Charlie's on. Correct. <laughs> Congratulations, you scored 22 points and no passes. around and had a few drinks and someone said did I fancy washing up? Washing up? <laughs> and did you, shall we say, get involved? No, I, at first I didn't want to get involved. <laughs> but my mate said I'd be a sissy if I didn't. <laughs> So I let them talk me into it. And did you enjoy washing up? Not at first, no. But gradually, I, I, I began to feel more at ease when I was with, with, with other people who, who were washing up. Did you ever seek counselling for your problems? <laughs> Not at first, no. But <clears throat> later you changed your mind? <coughs> yeah. I, I think if I'd have got help at first, I wouldn't have got myself into the scene I got myself into. And what scene was this? Well, I went to a New Year's Eve party at a friend's house. He, he invited some friends out I'd never seen before. I should have known there'd be trouble as soon as I saw their pennies. <laughs> and then someone asked me, did I fancy going into the kitchen? Into the kitchen? <laughs> yeah. And um, did you refuse? Well, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. Um, what did you find in the kitchen? It was horrible. Mm. There's quite a few people there. Mm. Mainly folks. And they were doing the hard stuff. 
just as mops, <laughs> yard brooms, that sort of stuff. And what was your reaction? Well, shock at first. And then someone I recognised as a local copper handed me his thick rubber squidgy. His squidgy? <laughs> Did you use the squidgy? Well, I didn't like it at first. It was wet and kept slipping through my fingers. But again, gradually, I, I felt more at ease when I had a squidgy in my hand. And it was this craving to do things that other people might find repulsive led you into a life of crime. I started doing houses. And what did that involve? Well, I'd break into their house, mainly while they were on holiday. And I'd polish the windows and clean the furniture. <laughs> and I'd take down the curtains, especially the nice pretty ones. And I'd take them to the dry cleaners. And I believe on one occasion you broke into a house whilst a man was asleep and washed and ironed his shirt and trousers whilst he was still wearing them <laughs> and without him noticing. And yet you made a recovery. Some would say a remarkable recovery. A recovery that saw you stop doing housework almost entirely. Oh, yeah. What happened? I got married. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to tell me what qualifications you have for this job. Well, I'm a man of many parts. And though I've had a shocking previous life, I pull myself together, and I'm used to hard graft. <coughs> well, I see you're from Bolton. I'll give you a bounce later. <laughs>
Joke in it. 
anyone. Anyone. The comedy of errors, for God's sake. Comedy of errors has the joke of two people looking like each other twice. It's not that funny, Raven. <laughs> Nibble. Nibble. Will you leave Orifice alone? <laughs> what a lot. Right. For the rest of this period, you will write about Eno Barbus. And the manager, just try and write Eno Barbus. <laughs> Either way up, boy, I'm not bothered. Usual rules, no referring, no cheating, no eating, no looking out the window, no slide rules, no slang. Use ink only, Byron Nib, if possible. <laughs> you may use dividers, but not on each other. Cassegin, you're in charge. <laughs> And Mr. Spigot, I understand it is Mr. Spigot. Mr. Spigot? Yes, Spigot by name, Spigot by name. Ah, <laughs> yes. Uh, there is no need to follow me, Mr. Spigot. Please, please, stood. You are here, I believe, to audition for the role of Tarzan. Right. <laughs> Mr. Spigot. I couldn't help but notice almost immediately as you came in that you are a one-legged person. You notice that. <laughs> when you've been in the business as long as I have, you tend to notice these trivial things almost immediately. You, a one-legged person, are here auditioning for the role of Tarzan. Correct. You, a unidexter, are here to audition for that role. Right. Mr. Spigot, does it not seem to you that you are in some way deficient in this matter? Very true. Need I point out the deficiency to you? Well, it is in the leg division. The leg division? The leg division, Mr. Spigot. You are deficient in the leg division to the tune of what? <laughs> now, your right leg, I love. I like your right leg very much. As soon as it came in, I think to myself, that is a noble leg. That is a wonderful leg. I have nothing against your right leg. The trouble of it is, neither have you. <laughs> you fall down on your left. You mean it's inadequate? I mean it's inadequate, Mr. Spigot. To my mind, the British public is just not yet ready to watch a one-legged eight man swinging through the jungle in <laughs> Fendrin. I see. However, do not despair. After all, you score over a man with no legs at all. <laughs> if a legless man came running in here, if I'm in the road, I would say, out, out, on your bike, get family. So, there's still a chance. Oh, there's still a chance. <laughs> if we get no two-legged actors in here within the next, say, two months, there's a very good chance that you will buy this bike in the road. Failing two-legged actors, you <coughs> and you need Dexter are the very person that we shall be attempting to contact Californicali. Well, thank you very much. So, the only advice I have to give you is this. Hop on a bus. <laughs> <laughs> Go home. Perch yourself by your telephone and away down the call. I'm very, very sorry that I can't be more definite than that, but it is a two-legged actor that we are after. Good day to you, Mr. Spinner.
evening. I'm a stranger in town. Direct me to your flat. Come one step nearer and I'll yell for my father. Where is your father? In Australia. <laughs> You're my type. Gentlemen prefer blondes. I'm no blonde. I'm a gentleman. <laughs> I'm looking for a girl who doesn't smoke, drink, swear, or go out with men. Why? <laughs> I'm a girl who knows what she wants. I want what I want when I want it. You'll get what I've got when I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't I seen you somewhere before? I'm sorry. I didn't recognise you standing here. Oh. <laughs> what Bridget Baldo got that I haven't got? Nothing. Only she's got it where it belongs. <laughs> Do you know what shape the kiss is? No. Well, give me one of the court square. <laughs> you look tired. Yes, I overslept this morning. You were in the arms of Morpheus? I certainly was not. I don't even know the man. <laughs> I dreamt about you last night. Did you? No, you wouldn't let me. So you dreamt about me? Yes, and I'd like to apologise. You go out with men. That's my business. I see, you're professional. <laughs> <laughs> I went out with a millionaire last night and he gave me a new coat. Did I do wrong? You might have done wrong, but you didn't do it badly. <laughs> Can I give you a lift? No, thanks. I live in a bungalow. I saved a girl from being out last night. Did you? Yes, I control myself. <laughs> Here's a box of your favourite chocolates. Oh, thank you. Bloody car, fancy. Ooh, my favourites too. Candidate number four, Miss Lou Pine, please. Hello. Hello. And uh, what qualifications? 
qualifications have you got for the post? Well, I like my work. But to be honest, I'm poor. And I need to keep the wolf from the door. Well, that's an interesting tale. <laughs> we'll find out. I'll contact you at your pad. <laughs> as one of the greatest artists of the modern era. Certainly one of the most expensive. None of his works sell for less than two million pounds. John has avoided all publicity until now. Tonight we have a world exclusive. John has agreed to give us his very first interview. Good evening, John. Hello. Hello. John, your work always thought of as being extremely difficult. Well, it's hard to do, difficult to do, but I don't think that it's difficult to understand. Oh, well, I think the critics will disagree with you there, as we shall see. Let's take a look at your first paper. This one's full of power and action with a, with a great sense of anger. To me, it encapsulates the central dichotomy of our existence, the continuous struggle between good and evil, night and day, light and dark. Can you tell us, John, what you were really trying to do? A rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> a rabbit? A rabbit, you see. It's got a little tail there, and a couple of floppy ears. There's a little bit of something there where I spilt something, or it could have been the rabbit. But when you look at it all, a rabbit. Forgive me. I see what you're really trying to say. It's, it's the cubist approach, isn't it? That through the brilliant use of objects, or in this case, animals, you're trying to restate the figurative notion that reality exists. Well, it, it, it's really a body rabbit. <laughs> it was small, you see, and it kept running about. That's why it was difficult to do. It's a body rabbit. Okay. Well, let, let's, let us move on. We'll move on to your second painting, which, with your usual dry wit, you call simply horse. It might have been Trojan horse, or horseman of the apocalypse, a man called horse. But whatever, it seems to refer to the evils of war and a renunciation of violence. It's our Mary's horse, <laughs> you see. She had to go to pony club, and so I was in a nurry. So I had to do it quickly in an afternoon. I'm nervous. Well, right. I, I think we better we better move on. Your your painting style has changed dramatically recently. Oh, yes. Most people feel that your basic inspiration was Mordic art, but do I detect the influence of Giotti or the surrealistic approach redolent of Dali and Picasso? It's, it's our bathroom wall. <laughs> you see, I found painting animals too big. And in any case, I got allergic to the fur and the smell and all that. 
So I had a crack <laughs> at painting the bathroom tiles. Yeah. Bathroom tiles. Well, how do you account for that extremely modern scar that runs across the painting like an acknowledgement of modern society? I mean, to me, it represents the central contradiction of our time. A materialistic society with the unfulfilled vision of the future, dangerously out of sympathy with its physical environment. John, in your own words, can you, can you explain to us that extremely modern scar? That's the grouty. <laughs> I, I, I thank you for pointing it out to me. Pointing it out to me. <laughs> well, I, I can see that you've not lost your sense of humor. Well, let's, let's move on to the final painting. So you can't get the staff, can you? <laughs> Which, among other things, is the most expensive. Some critics in the audience. This one, would you believe, sells for four million pounds. <laughs> yes. I love its vivid tonal images, don't you? The spatial depth, the juxtaposition of light and shade, David Hockney felt that your basic, your basic inspiration, or your influence, was really Roscoe. But the Royal Academy, on the other hand, felt that you must have done this under the influence of post-modernism. Can you tell us, what was your main influence? Fifteen pints of lager. <laughs> I got paid so much for my other painting that I went to celebrate, and I got water on And I did this in an afternoon. Well, th thank you, John. Um, it's, uh, it's been extremely fascinating, strangely reassuring to learn that such a great painter can't explain painting. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for, John, because we got a problem. Four million pounds, pounds a drain. <laughs> Our first item is Sea Fever by John Mesty. I must go down to the seas again, to the lonely sea in the sky. And all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by. And the wheels kick and the wind song and the white sail shaking. And a grey mist on the sea's face and a grey dawn breaking. I must go down to the seas again, for the call of the running tide is a wild call and a fair call that may not be denied. And all I ask is a windy day with the white clouds flying, and the slum spray and the blown spume and the seagull crying. I must go down to the seas again, to the vagrant gypsy life, to the girl's way and the whale's way, where the wind's like a whetted knife. And all I ask is a merry yarn from a laughing fellow rover, and a quiet sleep, and a sweet dream, when the long trip is over. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the short version, Sea Fever. Sea beckons, lad reckons, need ship. Three day, sails away, Ooh, long trip. <laughs> Comes home, writes poems, <laughs> have kids. <laughs> I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high old veils and hills. When all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. Beside the lake, beneath the trees, and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending lines along the margin of the bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, 
But they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Ladies and gentlemen, daffs. I once saw some daffs by a lake. A wonderful sight, no mistake. It gives me a thrill to think of them still. That sure was a real lucky break. <laughs> Well, to 
do plays like Shakespeare and they are all. Yes, sort of. <laughs> I've got a sort of persona. Well, you've got garlic bread and stuff like that, don't you? <laughs> I mean, stage present. Like Gilligood and Olivia. I like him. Too glorious, too <laughs> jelly and what's it? No, no, more like armchair theatre. What, just sitting there? That would suit you being dramatic in a comfy chair, wouldn't it? I'd have to learn to project myself. That's film, not theatre. No, no, I'd have to learn to throw my voice. Practice breath control. What, with six kids? It's a bit late, isn't it? <laughs> in any case, you'd never remember all those scripts. Look, it's 20 years since I last read Romeo and Juliet. Oh, and I can still remember when I uttered those immortal lines. X3, Brute! X3? Nobody stabbed the green thing. Eh? <laughs> Must have eaten one of theirs, most people would only eat two. Yeah. Well, I see, that's the genius of the bard of Avon. Ah, door to door cosmetics. <laughs> Cosmetic for every occasion. Out, down, spot. Black the fun, down the empire. But he had other catchphrases as well. Oh, that is pretty too. <laughs> Solid flesh would melt. Or. Tubby or not Tubby? <laughs> That's the question. He was a bit concerned about flash, wasn't he, Shakespeare? No. This is well built. Yes, I expect so. Hathaway was probably old English for ways of us. <laughs> but there again, you see, that's another of his phrases. Constipation is the mother of perspiration. <laughs> <laughs> and good lucky Louise was one of his as well, wasn't he? <laughs> probably. But you know something? If you've got half a hundred weight of flesh lying upstairs in bed waiting for you, I think you'd stay up late too writing plays, wouldn't you? <laughs> Michael Adams wants to see the Pope. Michael Adams wants to see the Pope. Michael Adams wants to see the Pope. Show him in. Evening, Your Grace. Good evening, Michael Angelo. I want to have a word with you about this last supper of yours. Oh, yes. I'm not happy with it. Oh, dear. It took hours. Not happy at all. What well, do the jellies worry you? <laughs> no, they had a bit of colour, don't they? I know. You don't like the kangaroo. What kangaroo? I'll alter it. No sweat. I never saw a kangaroo. It's right at the back. I'll paint it out. No problem. I'll turn it into an apostle or something. Ah, oh. well, I know. That's the problem. What is? The apostles. Too Jewish. <laughs> oh, yeah, I thought it'd make Peter the most Jewish. No, it's just that there are 28 of them. <laughs> well, another one you'd hardly notice. I'll turn it into an apostle. No. All right, all right, I'll lose it altogether. I was never completely happy with it anyway. That's not the point. There are 28 apostles. Too many? Of course it's too many. Well, in a way, yes. But I wanted to give the impression of a, a huge get-together. You know, not any old garden party. The real mother of a blowout. There were only 12 apostles at the Last Supper. Well, maybe some of the others came along. There were only 12 apostles altogether. Well, maybe they brought some friends. There were only twelve apostles and our Lord at the Last Supper. The Bible clearly says so. No friends? No friends. Waiters? No. Cabaret? No! But you see, I like them. There were all... the canvas? I suppose I could lose two or three. There were only twelve apostles at the Last Supper. I've got it. We'll call this the penultimate supper. <laughs> what? Well, if there was a last one, there must have been one before it, right? Oh, yes. So there you are, then. We'll call this the penultimate supper. The Bible doesn't say how many was on that one now, does it? <laughs> no, but... Well, there you are, then. Look, the Last Supper was a significant event in the life of our Lord. The penultimate supper.
Liverpool was not, even if they had a conjurer and a steel band. <laughs> now, I commissioned a Last Supper from you, and a Last Supper I won't. Yes, but look, with <laughs> twelve apostles and one Lord. One? Yes, one. Now, please tell me what possessed you to paint this with three lords in it. It works, mate. It does not work. It does. The fat one balances the two skinny ones. <laughs> there were only twelve apostles at the last supper. I know that. There was only one saviour. I know that. We all know, know that. What, what about a bit of artistic license? There was only one redeemer. I'll tell you what you want then. It's a flaming photographer, not a creative artist with a bit of imagination. <laughs> I'll tell you what I want. I want a last supper with twelve apostles and one lord by Thursday lunchtime. Or you don't get paid. Fascist! Look how the Pope I am. I may not know much about art, but I know what's going up on that wall. And if you can't do it, you're back decorating that ceiling on Saturday. <laughs> Simmer's Drama Group now presents The Art of Witchcraft, a comedy review. This case is for all styles of humour, as well as popular ca classics. Many of the quick fine sketches have been written especially for this production. The emphasis throughout in, is on this comedy. Tom Jones, the director and producer, hopes that the venue will enable you to enjoy over two hours of very comedy together with a drink and good company in the relaxed environment. Well done, thanks very much. Okay. Right. Hey, are you putting about the time for me? Pardon? Are you putting about the time for me? Could be. Yeah. Well, I don't even know you. Well, is it in then? I don't know. <laughs> is it you putting it about that he's barmy? I don't want any. You don't want any. Want any what? How much are they? Hey, I've been to South Africa. Oh, have you? Yeah. Very nice people, the South Africans. I was very popular, you know. Mm, you would be. Very nice people. They gave me a present. Oh, they would. They never let you come away empty-handed if it was just a coconut or something. No, they gave me a present. Oh, yes. What did they give you for a present? Yeah. Two man-eating lions. <laughs> Real man-eating lions? Yeah. Did you bring them to England? Yeah. Where do you keep them? In this box. <laughs> well, they in there now. Yeah. I thought I heard a rustling. <laughs> Get two cups of coffee, one with strychnine in it. Are you telling about the lions? Oh, yes. He's got two man-eating lions in this box. How much are they? <laughs> oh, he doesn't want to sell them. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to Nyasaland as well. Oh, have you? They're very nice people, the yeah. Nyasans. They gave me a present as well. Oh, they would. What did they give you for a present? A giraffe. <laughs> did you bring it with you to England? Yeah. I think I know where he's going. <laughs> <laughs> Don't like to ask him. Where do you keep the giraffe? In this box. <laughs> I'll keep him talking. You go dial 999. <laughs> you tell me about my giraffe. Oh, yes, he's got the giraffe in this box with the two lions. Is it black or, or is it white? <laughs> I don't know. He wants to know what colour the giraffe is. The one that copy I made. in my coffee as well. Hey. Yeah. I've been to India as well. Oh, hell, he's been all over. I bet they gave you a present as well. Yeah. What did they give you for a present? An elephant. 
don't be silly, you couldn't. Is it a, a male or a female? No, an elephant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you must know there's a male and... No, you wouldn't. <laughs> wouldn't matter to you anyway whether it was a male or a female. It wouldn't matter to anybody. <laughs> Only another elephant. <laughs> I'm going to stop you going to those youth clubs. <laughs> What's it with me, you know? Oh, yes. <laughs> Where do you keep it? In the box. Don't be silly. <laughs> you can get an elephant in there. No, no, it, it is silly when you think of it. Mm. I was getting carried away for a moment. I was carried away for good before long. <laughs> you couldn't get an elephant in that box. There's no room. You could always ask a giraffe to move over the bear. <laughs> Do you want the lions to get out and everybody panic? <laughs> no. I keep the elephants in a cage. In a cage, you silly thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. And um, where do you keep the cage? In, in the box. <laughs> You know, I'm a bit worried. Can I confide in you? I mean, you don't tell anybody, will you? No. Don't tell so. Not unless it's funny. <laughs> I'm consumed by the green monster. What? Your pet lizard? <laughs> <laughs> jealousy. I'm consumed by jealousy. My beloved is seeing another man. Why would your pet lizard see another man? <laughs> My wife is seeing another man. She started shaving. What, on the face? <laughs> no, her legs. She's also using that deodorizer, antiperspex. <laughs> well, perhaps she's trying to keep the magic of your marriage alive. Hmm. She's also joined one of those Agoraphobic. <laughs> what were those body stocking lappers? Yes. Well, she nipped it herself. More like a body sock. <laughs> and, but I don't understand this change. She must be seeing somebody else. Have you thought of hiring a private dick? <laughs> <laughs> what? Never saw that in the other pages. <laughs> It's like a private detective, someone who could discreetly do survival, mm. who could follow your wife for you. Mm. Mind you, you have to pay for it, and you're not very keen on paying for it, are you? Oh, it's not that. I'm generally depressed about life. I mean, is there another life after this? And where do we go when we die? Oh, I think you did be grand, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, is there reincarnation? Look! Could I come back as a racer? All you have to do is run a few races with a midget on your back. And then have all the food you want tied to your face in a bag. <laughs> I can see why you'd like that. <laughs> Personally, I'd come back as a dragonfly. A <laughs> dragonfly? What's the point of that? Well, they only live for a day. A day? Is it short, isn't it? Oh, that's where you're wrong. I saw this programme life on earth hmm. and this dragonfly emerges from its pupil dries its wings in the sun takes a drink of nectar slurp slurp and then he cops the nearest lady dragonfly cop cop and his eyes come out on stalks <laughs> or maybe he's out on stalks already anyway he doesn't mess about. He doesn't need a gin and tonic and meal down the chinkies. He's straight to board. And he box until her eyes pop out. And that's his complete day. Irk, irk, slurp, slurp, flutter, flutter, bonk, bonk. It's like a holiday in Ibiza. 
my dear, after one day you die. That's a bit short, isn't it? <laughs> ah, that's where you're wrong, because under the reincarnation system you come straight back as another dragonfly. Okay, slurp, slurp, flutter, flutter, bonk, bonk. And so on until the end of time. Bliss! That's typical, isn't it? You haven't understood reincarnation at all. Look! You might not come back as a dragonfly. You might come back as, as a dung beetle. <laughs> a dung beetle? How is that going to happen? Well, it's obvious. If you were a good dragonfly the first time around. Be a failure. How can you be a bad dragonfly? It's obvious. You come back. You don't realise you're only one day to live. You say to yourself, God, mate, I'm worn out with all that earth work. <laughs> I'll leave the swerving and the bonking till tomorrow. It's a good your pet as it can't talk. Why? Tell us if this up was a load of cobblers. <laughs> in holy matrimony. Will the bride and groom please stalk forward? Jeremy, do you take Amanda to be your lawful wedded wife, to love, honour and obey? I do. Amanda, do you take Jeremy to be your lawful wedded husband, to love, honour, obey and kill him after you both have mated? I do. Then, with the power invested in... Excuse me, excuse me. What was that last bit again? What? Kill him after you both have made it. Oh, that. Yes, that's, that's right. The female praying mantis always kills the male after the marriage has been consummated. Didn't you know? No, I didn't. Sorry. Well, don't worry about it. It's entirely natural. <laughs> Then, with the power invested in me, <laughs> and in the... <laughs> Sorry, what you're actually saying is that the two of us go away on honeymoon and only one of us comes back. <laughs> I suppose you could put it that way, yes. Now let's get on, shall oh, we? Yes, of course, sorry. Right, the power invested in me, when, and when, in the eyes... When, <laughs> when you say the female kills the male, is that after the first time they've, um, or can it be after a few times, you know, it's just after people? It's immediately after the first time. So on the That's the bottom line as far as the male brain mantis goes. Anything wrong? No. I wonder what it was worth it. <laughs> I booked the hotel for a fortnight. <laughs> well, make a mind up. Do you want to be married or not? Oh, yes. I want to be married, all right. Just this killing bit I don't like. <laughs> so it's put a damper on the day, don't you know? How does she do it, by the way? Didn't your father tell you anything? I never met him, he was murdered on this one. <laughs> oh yes, of course, but I was, I was forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> what is it, what is it, or what? Well, she clamps your throat between her incisors. Bite your head off in the frenzy of the climax. <laughs> Come on. I'm good, but I'm not that good. <laughs>
Dave Dog is also condemned as a quack for administering vinegar and brown paper. A similar incident involving Humpty Dumpty was reported to the health and safety executive. <laughs> Four and twenty blackbirds were baked in a pie in what the RSPCA have condemned <laughs> a scandalous treatment today. However, a maid who was having facial surgery to reattach her nose described the birds as vicious. Palace officials have refused to comment. <laughs> Juvenile crime is still on the increase. Tom, the pastor's son, was charged with pig theft. <laughs> However, his lawyers have argued that the beating he received contravenes human rights. Health promotion officials were praising the walk today to the top of the ten and back by over 10,000 men. <laughs> they were sponsored by the grand old Duke of York. <laughs> Divorce proceedings were started today by Jack Spratt, an anorexic. <laughs> <laughs> against his wife, who had full many a nervosa, <laughs> citing irreconcilable dietary differences. However, a spokesman said the evidence took from swallowing. <laughs> and finally, a farmer's wife was charged with cruelty to visually handicapped mice, despite the offer of help from a local retailer. Her daughters, Mary and Bo Peep, were also charged with sheep molesting. <laughs> The brother, little boy Blue, is being investigated by the vast squad. <laughs> <laughs> On next week's news, we'll be hearing of the impact of silicone treatments. When we talk to not so little Polly Flinders, <laughs> far from little Miss Muppet, and enormous Jack Horner. <laughs> Good evening. Christmas round at her house. 
Never needed a bottle opener or a nut cracker to someone to put your fat to me. Hey, Sheila, tell him about your Elaine Page record. Elaine Page? No, blonde, titchy. She sang, um, Ibiza. I'll be past her over at Royal Wedding for that Kiwi tea watch if you <laughs> Bye. 